<laughs> Welcome to our chat, Paul and Mariella. <laughs> Mariella, it's been a long time. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm actually doing pretty good, thanks. I'm doing pretty good. And we've been planning to have another catch up chat for some yes. time. And what is it, almost two years? Really? Maybe a year plus. It was in the middle of COVID last time when we when all hell broke loose of, you know. Which is going on forever. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah but I'm glad we got it together. We're doing it. Well, finally, I guess there's one little detail, though, that we overlooked. Yeah. We haven't Which actually is? figured out what we're going to talk about. <laughs> true, true. So but, let's see where it goes. But small details. So... Well, I guess um, we had a conference, a low carb all stars a few weeks back and we had 26 presenters there. So there's probably a few new things that popped up in that. And, you know, if you're anything like me, then you've probably come across a few interesting articles in the last 18 months or so. So yeah, it's a constant learning. So uh, what, what kind of stuff did you guys learn about? At the conference? Well, you know, we opened with Tim Noakes and he's uh, actually talking about a paper that he's got uh, headed for publication in the British Medical Journal, the Open Heart. And this is about, uh, I guess, quintessentially what's a cover up um, within the Women's Health Initiative study, where the results that they've actually had have been, uh, for whatever reason, have apparently been misrepresented. And the reality of the data actually uh, would indicate that those females who went on the low-fat diet actually had uh, worse outcomes. Uh, but it looks yeah. like, for whatever reason, that message has been obscured in being clearly trans transmitted. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, we had the metabolics conference here in Israel, and Tim Noakes was also uh, uh, one of the participants, and we discussed this as well. So, um, well, it's, uh... it's really quite quite shocking. And I mean, I guess the interesting thing for me was that I did a couple of lectures on the history of cholesterol lowering medications. And the data is actually quite scary. So even before statins, there was another class of drugs that was actually shown to lower statins and that had um, uh, record speed approval by the FDA in America and it was rushed to market and it was really looking like it was gonna be a blockbuster drug. Um, it did everything that people wanted it to do. It, it lowered this pesky LDL, which as you know, mm -hmm. I guess the only problem was that people were getting very sick and uh, dying and it ended up being pulled off the market in pretty short order. And there was some significant financial penalties that were incurred. Which drug is this? Well, this drug was called Treparanol. Mm -hmm. um, which, which nobody's ever heard about. And yeah. then I, I guess the next thing is that the, uh, the very first statin drug, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor that was actually approved, um, well, it was, it was developed by an American pharmaceutical company, but they were actually in a competition with a Japanese pharmaceutical company called Sankayo for a, a period of time. And the Japanese mm -hmm. company, for all intents and purposes, was actually quite ahead in a lot of the stages of their research. And then for some unknown reason, they just pulled out of the race altogether. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that too many of the lab animals were developing cancer of the small intestine. And they really? decided wow. that this statin was simply not safe enough to continue to develop. And interestingly enough, that very same statin, that same molecule was the very first statin that was approved and ended up being a billion dollar drug. Now, it's really wow. food for thought. Wow, that uh, leaves me uh, pretty... <laughs> anyway, you can, you can still buy this drug. And then um, there's... Wait, other... was it, the very first one was statin, correct? Yes, yes. So this yeah. was actually initially, that was the drug that the Japanese researchers stopped bringing to market because it was causing too much cancers in their lab animals. Hmm. All right. Um, very interesting. Is there any data looking at uh, colon cancer in relation to 
statins that we know of that it's like just you know it's difficult to well this is actually small intestinal um so not small the intestinal. colon being the large bowel small, intestinal, actually, small intestinal cancers um i haven't actually looked into that it, to be honest this is the kind of thing that drug companies are really not going to be looking for um, mm -hmm. and as you know that at oxford university which has pretty much got all the participant level data for statins under lock and key um, yeah. i would suggest that they're probably not going to be giving us a lot of access to this kind of information so interesting it's a little bit of a problem i guess um, but you know what do you do do you prescribe statins to your uh, male patients who've had a heart attack uh, i give my patients informed consent i tell them what the literature says about the benefits and i tell them what the literature says about the risks and i'm yet to have any patient after hearing that statistic ask me for a prescription i would verily very happily provide a prescription if somebody wanted it um, after provision, provision of informed consent. So like yourself, my job isn't to be paternalistic about this. I'll give the patients what they want. I feel that my job is to just educate the patient. So, I mean, doctor in Latin means teacher. I mean, I, and that's how I feel that my role is. And if after learning about statins that somebody still wants to take one, be my guest. You know, so I, what I, do you tell them? Let, let's hear how, how you present. Well, what do I tell them? So, and I'm a male who's had a heart attack, given that that's the, the category that we have the most data on, right? Sure. What would you say? Well, the first thing is, I would want to know exactly what benefit do you, as somebody who's had a heart attack, expect to derive from that statin? And normally most people say, well, you know, they, and they're very vague. And the reason they're vague is because their doctors who have prescribed statins previously haven't been very clear about what benefits they'll expect. So I put it into plain English and I say, the reason you take this drug is because you don't want to have another heart attack. And you think by taking this drug, you will live longer. And when they hear it like that, most people go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, I want to live longer. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, how much on average do you think you will live longer if you take this drug? So for people who have had a heart attack, there was a very good um, review study done a few years back that was published in British Medical Journal. And that actually collated all the available data and looked at average lifespan increase. And for people who had had a heart attack, what we call secondary prevention, the increase in lifespan from taking a statin drug for several years was 4.1 days. So then most people are actually quite shocked to hear that because they imagine it will help them live for years. And then we talk about side effects of the statins and things like, you know, muscle aches, muscle pains, memory impairment. Um, we know it can be associated with a significantly increased risk of developing diabetes and worse blood sugar control if you have diabetes. So these are not benign medications. Yeah, one in 10, in fact, developed diabetes. <laughs> well, the Women's Health Initiative study. So the baseline level of data for females taking statins found that they, and this is unadjusted data, it was just the baseline level, found that females taking a statin were 71% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. These are not benign drugs. Right, and right, right. So I, I simply see my job is to say, yes, there is, potentially a mortality benefit, but that mortality benefit is relatively short. And I give them a number that they can actually interpret. And then I talk about the relative risks. And what I usually don't tell them, um, but should actually inform the conversation as well, is that a lot of the data on statin drugs is still under lock and key. Independent researchers to this day do not have independent access to the participant level data on statins. So that makes you wonder. So when we've got 4.1 days advantage, how would that either increase or decrease if we actually had access to the full level of data? It's uh, food for thought really.
Right, right. Another way, I think uh, maybe it was it the same paper or a different paper that described that 63 men who have had a heart attack need to take a statin for five years for one person uh, to not have an, another event. Uh, I think uh, that's that's one of the numbers uh, that I saw there. Oh, yeah. So this number needed to treat is really important. Right. And uh, the problem that we have is it's very easy to confuse people with relative statistics and absolute statistics. So as an example, let's say you've got a, uh, a half a percent chance of having a heart attack in any one year. Now, what happens if I can reduce your chance of having a heart attack from 0.5% to 0.25%? It's a 50% reduction. <laughs> I've reduced your risk of having a heart attack by 0.25%. But if I was a drug company, do you know how I'd sell that to you? Yes, of course. <laughs> it's a 50% reduced risk of having a heart attack. So yes, technically that is correct. If we compare both statistics side by side, the relative risk reduction is 50%. But most people, when they hear that 50%, they think their risk of having a heart attack will be you know, hugely reduced. When you tell them that you know, the correct interpretation of that data would be 0.25%, one quarter of 1%, I'd be like, well, you know, that's, is that really worth hanging my hat on? I mean, you know, medicine's been doing this, you know, for a long time. They, yes. it's, it sells drugs and it sells drugs well. But I, yeah, I guess but it's, it's been particularly, it's, it's, it's worked very well on all our colleagues and our, myself included until I discovered this, these facts that you're talking about now. Oh, you know, and, and I'm no different. I'm no different. I mean, I recently, I had a conversation, it was just last night with another doctor. And the, it was a bit of an awkward conversation because in one sentence, she said, oh, I'm an evidence-based practitioner. I'm absolutely always evidence-based. And I'm thinking, hey, this conversation's going well. She said, I always follow the guidelines. <laughs> And, contradiction in and of itself right? well and it, it made for a really awkward conversation because we actually shared care for a patient and it, it was very difficult to uh, how do you communicate to another doctor who doesn't have access to that data who doesn't actually uh you know hasn't read the literature that you and i have read who hasn't asked the questions the critical questions of what we've been taught and who still blindlessly trusts um, whatever has been taught in medical school, whatever practice guidelines are put out there. I had an endocrinologist here, and I did think of you um, a few weeks ago, um, Dr. Saji Suraj, and he mm -hmm. said to me, he goes, Paul, the worst thing that could possibly happen to a diabetic patient is that they follow the diabetic diet that's recommended in the guidelines. And he was uh, absolutely correct. <laughs> a rare find. <laughs> but um, one of the things that really interested me um, from the conference, uh, you know, all the talks were, you know, absolutely insightful and fascinating, but Zoe Harkham has a way of just cutting through. And she one really of her is. comments, like, and we've always blamed saturated fat for causing a rise in LDL cholesterol. Um, and that's just conventional folklore. But she elucidated it really well. And she said there's no known mechanisms by which saturated fat increases LDL. And I believe that to be true because I've spent a lot of time looking at the literature, looking for mechanisms. Nobody has ever been able to describe it. But what we do know is that certain things called plant sterols which basically confuse our body. They're basically plant chemicals that our body absorbs thinking they're useful chemicals, but they're not. They have no role in mammalian physiology at all. And they right. basically, they screw with our ability to synthesize cholesterol. So if you're consuming um, oils of plant origin that can contain these sterols, that will artificially and lower problematically lower your LDL level. So in actual fact, 
it's not the presence of saturated fats in the diet that is associated with a higher LDL level. It's the absence of the plant sterols that leads to a normalization of your LDL level. The LDL Very level that you're looking at on a high saturated fat diet, and I don't think Zoe explicitly stated it like this, but this is certainly the logical extension of what she says. So the natural level of LDL is that seen on a high saturated fat diet. And the lower LDL levels that we see otherwise are usually artificially lowered in the presence of plant sterols. As humans, we've never been designed to consume vegetable oils and seed oils and plant sterols. Right. Now, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we don't know what else is being interfered by the plant sterols uh, and what other processes are, are being, uh, mess, you know, being uh, interfering with. But the other thing that I'm thinking of, I mean, the LDL size goes down, right? So the LDL area goes down in the presence of metabolic disease. So that alone leads to a lower number in a way, doesn't it? Well, I mean, yeah, so it depends on, so we have two ways of looking at LDL. We can have what we call a particle count where we count one, two, three, four, this number of LDL particles. Right. But when I'm talking about the calculated, yeah. Or we can actually have a look at the total volume of mm -hmm. LDL cholesterol. And that's why, you know, I, you know, the cardiologists are gradually moving in the, the direction of doing what we call a particle count because we know that LDL particles that are so-called small dense are actually atherogenic. They're the ones that will be contributing to the increased risk of atherosclerosis. So certainly uh, anything that is associated with oxidative stress, glycation stress has the potential to basically um, shrink for one of a better term, LDL particles. And seed oils that contain plant sterols also contain a lot of oxidation products. And these oxidation products have definitely been shown to lead to oxidation of LDL. Of that, there is no doubt. We can actually measure, if we give somebody a seed oil, we can then measure what we call a chylomicron, which is a, a, another lipoprotein that's somewhat related to LDL. It's in the same class of molecules. We can actually measure oxidation within the chylomicrons after you ingest a meal of oxidized seed oils. And we can also see then down the track we'll also see some of those oxidation products are transferred to the LDL particles, the low density lipoproteins. So yeah, there's in no way should we be consuming oxidized seed oils um, and all things that also contain plant sterols. It's a one, two punch that's uh, deleterious. So where else would plant sterols be found besides uh, seed oils? <laughs> and besides what they're added to, so, I mean, these things are a huge marketing boon. So they're, they're plant food. So they're, they're not found in any natural animal foods that would be consuming. Right, so um, but you do have to, you know, they, they are, um, I don't know if you remember cholestyramine, which is you yeah, know, an old yeah, way of reducing yeah. cholesterol. And it just so happened that, yes, it is very effective at reducing cholesterol levels. It just doesn't happen to improve mortality at all. And, right. you know, systematic reviews of the data clearly show that. Uh, if you buy margarine, you know, things that have been deliberately um, have increased levels of plant sterols. So plant sterols, for all intents and purposes, while they've never, ever been shown to have any positive health benefits, they're certainly promoted as such. And they're certainly added to a to certain food items. Yeah, they even sell it as pills, right? They sell like plant sterols for decreasing in, uh, LDL. Yeah, so. absolutely. And it just so happens, though, that people on average with higher LDL levels live longer. So there's a, there's a degree of irony with that one. Say that again, say that statement again, because it's very interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, so on average, people with high LDL levels live longer. And Which is just like crazy, right? It's just crazy that this is a fact. And we mm -hmm. hear all kinds of arguments against that. And the most common argument we hear is one of reversed causation, reverse causality, because we know that the, the argument goes like this. It says, oh, yes, but when people get sick, their LDL levels go down. And indeed, this is true because yes. we know that in the last two years of life, we will be able to reliably detect a lowering of LDL levels. That mm -hmm. is without a shadow of doubt true. So then people say, well, they've only got low LDL level. The people 
with low LDL levels, they're already dying and it's a marker of sickness. So it's not really the low LDL levels that actually kills them. So yeah. then we do these studies where we eliminate people with chronic disease. We say there's no diabetes, there's no pre-existing heart disease. You can't have any risk factors that would mean you'd be on a statin or anything like that. And when we remove those patients from the studies, people with low LDL levels still die more. And even then, if we break it into quartiles, so we have four quartiles, the people with the lowest level, second lowest, third lowest, and the highest. Even if we remove people from the lowest level and compare the second quartile with the top quartile, we still see a, a relationship where people with higher LDL levels live longer, people with lower LDL levels die sooner. So the whole reverse causality argument is bunkum. And we're still, we've, we still haven't gotten over Ansel Keys diet heart hypothesis, even though the Journal of the American College of Cardiology in September 2020, I think it was, published uh, an expert opinion piece that clearly stated there was no evidence to restrict saturated fat in the diet. This whole focus on LDL was pretty much out of date. We really need to be looking at the triglyceride to the HDL ratio, what, a pattern for what we call atherogenic dyslipidemia, meaning you know, high triglycerides and low HDL are really what leads to heart disease. And they specifically stated that under no circumstances is there evidence to support restricting meat or eggs or dairy in the diet. These animal, you know, based foods that are rich in saturated fat have never been shown to cause harm. The issue is, is that uh, the official guidelines are not keeping up with this. So they still insist on lowering saturated fat. I mean, it's, it's a crime. Oh, there's so much political influence behind them. I mean, what's just happened in the US is nothing short of a travesty. I mean, they deliberately go out of their way to cherry pick data to avoid doing what would truly be easiest would be to do a comprehensive review of the literature, just look at everything, take the high quality of pieces of research and summarize them. But instead, they have to go out of their way cherry picking and tiptoeing their way around certain papers and they there's no way that a, you know an impartial observer could look at the process and say that's a fair process that's a good scientific process it's such a distorted process and it's happening the world over it, and it's happening where you are it's happening where I am it's happening in the US it's happening in Europe yeah it's a, it's a big problem because uh until that changes, there's no talking to people who work in institutions like the dietitians. I gave a lecture this morning to dietitians and, and there's nothing you can do about it. They work in an institution and they have to follow the guidelines. So there's, this is, it, it's a big problem. And th it, that's why it, it's really key to have that change. Although doctors now, at least in Australia, have been given a little bit more latitude to follow the literature. It used to be that we'd had the Gary Fetkis of this world who would recommend to his patients that they shouldn't consume sugar and he would be shut down and told that he as a doctor has no right to tell, give patients outrageous, extreme advice to not consume sugar. So it now looks like that we actually do have flexibility where it's supported by peer-reviewed literature. But that's only one doctor here, one doctor there. And it, it's certainly not the mainstream and it's not being introduced in medical schools. So 99% of doctors are still stuck in the old paradigms. Yeah. Well, let's go back to your question of what really causes heart disease. And then you started to talk about the triglycerides and HDL. So, yeah, so well, if well, this is really interesting. So I'm uh, currently going to be well, about to start doing a bit of a collab paper with a couple of other authors on heart disease and trying to synthesize all the information together. But we've gotten so much about heart disease wrong, and that includes myself um, for a long time. So let's start with one of the most exciting things that I think we've learned in the last few years. And that comes from a chap called Vladimir Sabotin. Um, and he actually looked at some slides of vessels that were clogged with fat, what we call atherosclerosis. And he actually looked at the gradient of this dam, these uh, cholesterol deposits in the wall. Mm -hmm. And 
our traditional thinking has been that we've had the hollow blood vessel with a lumen in the middle and that the fat would somehow work its way through the endothelial layer, which we traditionally think about as being a single layer of cells, and then it would work its way deeper. But when mm -hmm. he actually had a look at it under a microscope, the concentration gradient actually happened in the other direction. It actually right. looked like it was more was on the outside and less on the inside. It was indicating that it looked like it was traveling from the outside in, not from the inside out. Right, from the small and vessels on the outside. What actually happens is that within a blood vessel, a blood vessel also needs to have a blood supply. So that has these tiny little blood vessels called vasa vasorum um, that go to it. And it looks like the this damage, this oxidized LDL and glycated LDL and all of this. So it's still, you know, that absolutely our thoughts about damaged LDL being a role important is still absolutely true. But the interesting thing is here, it looks like it's being delivered along these small vessels, the vasa vasorum. And that potentially explains why veins, which don't really have as rich a blood supply because they're smaller vessels, um, are much less susceptible to atherosclerosis than arteries. And why? Yeah, very really fascinating. fascinating. No, yeah, really. so that that was fascinating to me. It's just that it it doesn't really change our management, um, but it just shows you how medicine has gotten it wrong for so many years. And this single layer of cells, we used to think about it, and I used to think about it until relatively recently. We would have these uh, cells um, basically joined together at what we call gap junctions. These were the endothelial cells, the cells that lined the blood vessels, and somehow they would have a stress and they would separate a little bit and then the cholesterol would pass down between the gaps of those. Right. And in actual fact, if you actually have a look at the endothelium, it's not just a single layer of cells, it's multiple layers of cells. I mean, each individual um, LDL particle would have to have the skills of Houdini to really be able to do, you know, weave its way through all of these endothelial cells. And there's multiple lines of evidence that we've just been completely wrong. And Vladimir Sabotin has actually published a very compelling paper on this in peer reviewed literature. It's just had no attention. And I guess uh, I'm hoping to sort of write a, a bit of a paper where we, we sort of uh, integrate um, Vladimir's work with our understandings of oxidized and damaged LDL and how you know that relates to LDL receptors and um, scavenger receptors on macrophages and things like that. So it's going to be a little bit complex, but I'm hoping that that will provide a, a complete enough picture, and that we'll get it in the literature that you know some people will look at it and will will take an interest and say, well, the evidence is absolutely compelling. Um, it's undeniable. Uh, we need yeah. to start looking about atherosclerosis differently. And we need to worry about oxidation stress and we need to worry about glycation stress. So basically the combination of sugars in the diet and seed oils in the diet, uh, you know, public enemies number one and two in so far as causing heart disease. And I mean, look, that's uh, something that probably we in the low carb community haven't really um, focused on enough, um, the, the harms of oxidized seed oils. Uh, I agree with that. It's become my my passion over the last year. Yeah, and <laughs> but it, you know, it always comes second. First, you have to understand the sugar, and then you move on to the seed oil. <laughs> well, I don't even separate the two anymore. And mm -hmm. for that, so you recall earlier we talked about how if you consume an oxidized seed oil, we can measure it in something called a chylomicron. Now, when we measure, so they've done studies where they've got people to consume an oxidized oil and they've measured the oxidation levels in the circulation that result from that. And they've done it in three populations, a healthy population, a diabetic population with well-controlled blood sugar levels, and a diabetic population with poorly controlled blood sugar levels. And what they actually... Okay, so the three groups again, can you say that again? Okay. So after a little technical glitch, we'll carry on. Yeah, so basically the, uh, the combination of seed oils and sugar is particularly deleterious and you can't really tease apart one or the other. So one of my favorite studies actually looked at what happens when you gave people an oxidized oil and measured the oxidation products that were circulating around their body thereafter. And they had three groups. So one of them was a healthy group. One of them was a group with diabetes. 
who with well-controlled blood sugars. And one of them was a poorly controlled group of diabetics. And when they measured the circulating um, oxidation, they actually found that the poorly controlled diabetics had far higher levels of oxidation products in their bloodstream after this meal of uh, oxidized oil than both the, uh, the well-controlled diabetics and the healthy population. But the striking finding was the duration that the oxidation persisted for. And understand that every second that that oxidation product is in your circulation, it has potential to do damage. In the healthier population, so well-controlled sugars, the oxidation products were detected for about eight hours. In the poorly controlled diabetics, they were detectable for 72 hours a nine times increase. Mm -hmm. So have no doubt that oxidation products are, are bad and being a poorly controlled diabetic will make that it's many, gross. many times worse. So I, I don't even bother teasing them apart anymore. They're right. one and the same. If you want an ingredient for heart disease, then have your processed food that's got both seed oil and sugar. Absolutely. No, what I meant about the, the two the two steps is that I, the, in the low carb community, I think there's first an understanding of the dam as the people first the dam the damage of sugar, and then you keep reading and you keep understanding that there's also the seed oils. It's not enough just to take the sugar away. But oh yes, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's probably where we've missed a trick. I mean, people like you and I, who are, I guess, thought leaders within the low carb community, I think it's probably uh, falls upon us to try and educate people a bit earlier in their journeys about the harms of seed oils. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a bit of a Johnny come lately to it myself. I've, 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 I've probably been talking about it for uh, maybe two, three years, but I've been banging on about carbs for a lot longer than that. Right, right. That's what I'm expressing. The same, I had the same path. So, so it's, uh, it takes, it's longer also, um, you know, with, with sugar, it's, it's much easier to understand the elevation of insulin, et cetera, that here it's a little bit more, you know, we're still learning exactly what are the mechanisms by which seed oils are causing damage and, uh, and even at the mitochondrial level, right? Oh, and that's the, that's really fascinating when we have a look at the mitochondrial research. And I mean, that's going to be doing my head in um, for a long time yet. But at the end of the day, um, you can make some very strong arguments that a large number, you know, possibly most chronic diseases actually have their origins in mitochondrial dysfunction. Absolutely. How do you think insulin or what do we know about insulin's um, inflammatory uh, action uh, work on the mitochondria. Is, is, is this uh, something that you're familiar with directly? Is this something that... I'm not sure I, I, I would agree with the premise. Okay, because I'm not sure about it. inherently inflammatory. Um, I, I see... No, but I'm saying not, not inherently, but uh, hyperinsulinemia. That is, yeah. I mean, I think hyperinsulinemia... Oh, well, absolutely. Hyperinsulinemia is inflammatory, um, but it's what it represents. It's a surrogate marker for something else. Okay. Um, you know, if you have high insulin levels, that also means that you're probably got, you know, suboptimal sugar levels. Your sugar levels are probably spiking up and down. Um, there's multiple causes of insulin resistance. It could be that there's autoimmune inflammation going on. There could be issues with your thyroid gland, which we know can be associated with insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Although um, insulin so is also, it is, it, it does have, uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it does also have direct inflammatory uh, uh, causes, doesn't it? In, in, in excess. You, you don't well, agree with essentially, that? Essentially, but, but insulin in and of itself is an essential hormone for life. And I just have trouble conceptualizing that something which you and I both. Uh -oh. Insulin that we are releasing for our very survival would have these inherently deleterious effects. Well, for example, but we know, for example, that it increases um, smooth muscle migration at the arteries. Okay, like in excess, insulin is actually responsible for cardiovascular disease, but in and of by itself. Actually, there's a nice paper in the New England Journal where you the insulin hyperinsulinemia in without any connection to the other uh, 
syndrome that it that it actually causes, you know, the high triglycerides, low HDL, obesity, all of these things, in and of itself, insulin is actually responsible for cardiovascular disease as well. So um, and just well, I, I mean, when we do know, so if we have a look at there are multiple pathways. So if we have a look at uh, diabetic eye disease, um, we know that we we blame something called vascular endothelial growth factor for that angiogenesis where you get a proliferation of blood vessels and basically cause, you know, you can cause diabetic retinopathy and blindness. So much so that we inject monoclonal antibodies right. uh, targeting um, vascular endothelial growth factor. And if you actually look at the literature, um, high levels of insulin will increase that. Yeah. Um, there's multiple, if we have a look at hypertension, um, one of the things that we know is that, um, hypertension is an insulin driven factor. And we often measure something called renin, which is a hormone related to kidney function, which you'll know, you know, being an endocrinologist, you'll know this far better than me. Um, but insulin is actually a key driver in the secretion of renin. If we exclude renal artery stenosis or problems with blood supply to the kidneys, um, which most people frankly don't have, Right. Um, with high right. blood pressure, then it's uh, the relationship between insulin and renin is a much uh, more key driver in that pathway. So certainly insulin in excess does have problems. I guess I'm probably being a little bit esoteric here and I'm probably be, you know, being a bit of a pedant. Which no, but I, it's good. I, like, I like this. <laughs> about um, what exactly inflammation is. So I wouldn't necessarily consider smooth muscle migration or an excess of muscle no, no. endothelial growth factor or renin. These are all bad things in excess, but I probably wouldn't put them under the group of inflammation. Right. Me, That's why I was asking you because I, I have read about this, but not enough, you know, about hyperinsulinemia leading to inflammation directly, but I just don't remember the details. That's why I was wondering. Yeah. What you and I, I'm certainly, I haven't delved deep into the literature on this myself. So you know, take absolutely everything I say with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. But for me, inflammation, I, the, the more I learn about inflammation, the more I come back to a concept of something called nutritional immunity. Okay. And the way I see the role of inflammation is to control the availability of iron in the body. And this sounds crazy. So uh, you'll have to hear me out a little bit. I will. So if you subscribe to uh, a theory of evolution based in our, our human traits, um, well, you know, even if you don't, humans are subject to being infected with bacteria and with parasites and with germs. And without exception, every single one of these pathogens that can invade us has a degree of reliance on iron. And it just so happens that we're a smorgasbord for that. So we've got iron circulating around in our circulation. We're a buffet for whatever parasite wants to infect us. Mm. And our, our bodies know this. And they know very clearly that if we're able... Do you hear that crackling? Uh, no. Hmm. Okay. If, a, if a, something lights up, then you'll know why. Okay. So we're basically a buffet for that. And our immune systems know that if they can restrict the availability of iron, it will make it easier for our immune system to eradicate that particular pathogen. And this is the concept of nutritional immunity. So what actually happens is that when we have an inflammatory trigger from an infection, within hours, even quicker, the level of iron in our circulation plummets precipitously. We've done studies where we injected people with uh, lipopolysaccharide, which is a, a, a known toxin associated with inflammation. And within two hours, there's been a greater than 50% reduction in the amount of iron circulating freely in the serum. Right. And that's a protective response because if we can take away this iron from whatever pathogen, the immune system has an easier job to eradicate that pathogen. Is this and when the ferritin goes up? Yeah, exactly. Because ferritin is a cage that stores iron. So you take free circulating iron out of the circulation and you push it into ferritin. Okay, and that's why ferritin is an acute okay, phase yeah. reactant. That's why ferritin goes up. And that's why when doctors look at your ferritin level and say, don't worry about it, you've got heaps of iron. It, it, it's, they, I 
to be careful about what I say. It means they're not thinking clearly because that iron in ferritin does not reflect iron that is necessarily available for you to use. If you're inflamed, the iron will be in a one direction. It will be going into ferritin and it won't be coming out of ferritin. Mm -hmm. It's irrelevant whether your ferritin level is 30, 50, 100 or 200. If you have that inflammation and your body is in that preservation mode, then you will not be able to access that iron. And so that's the process of inflammation is largely predicated on removing iron from the circulation. This is called nutritional immunity. And that's how I think about it. And we have multiple consequences that arise from when we sequester this iron. This is called a functional iron deficiency. So we might see that one of the proteins that carries iron around the body being transferrin, that that lowers. So that's, uh, that's the protein of iron availability. And we know with chronic inflammation that drops, you have less ability to use iron. Now we talked about mitochondria before, and we know that you've got these cytochromes um, within the electron transport chain within the mitochondria. These require iron for their function. If you have low iron, either a complete deficiency of iron in the body or a functional iron deficiency because of inflammation, you impair the mitochondria's ability to function. So we've done studies where we've had females who have been absolutely iron deficient, They've been given an iron infusion. They've been given absolutely zero advice on diet and exercise. And they all routinely lose weight, improve their cholesterol levels, lose inches around their waist, <laughs> simply because you restore the ability of the body to function correctly. Which wow, that's fascinating. For. Here's another thing. Um, have you ever had a patient with iron deficiency who's had features of anxiety and depression, you give them an iron infusion and they come back and they're just feeling happier. They don't know why. When we have a look at what we call the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, these are all dependent on iron as a necessary cofactor for their synthesis. Quite literally, if you are inflamed and you create a, a situation of this functional iron deficiency, then say an infection can do that, then you'll actually reduce the neurotransmitters um, that you can produce. So we all joke about the man flu, you know, the man gets a cold and he goes into a deep funk. He, he's on the couch, he can't get up, you know, he needs somebody to pat his brow, you know, and, and we all joke about it, but it's actually based in fact, chronic inflammation. And we have known about this acute inflammation. We've known about for years leads to depression. Right. And so we know this, we get taught about this, you know, people just feel bad when they get a virus, their, their brain doesn't function, they have brain fog, they can't concentrate. This is because you actually have, you, you create this neurotransmitter deficiency. Um, and the problem is that it's okay if it's an infection. So you get an infection, this happens, you eradicate the infection, because that's when restricting iron it helps your immune system eradicate the infection and then things go back to normal. But what happens if you have an inflammatory trigger from another cause that's not an infectious cause, say an autoimmune cause where your immune system through a case of mistaken identity is attacking part of your body, say it could be a Hashimoto's thyroiditis or something like that. Is it possible that that inflammatory trigger could trick the body into thinking you have an infection and lead to this same level of iron sequestration mm -hmm. that we see um, with an acute infection that we see with a man flu. Absolutely, we can. We see it and it does happen. And if you understand that the consequences of neurotransmitter deficiency, um, it's not just on your mood, it also impacts on your eating behaviors. Let's for instance, say that I've managed to suck out the dopamine and serotonin from your brain, you're going to be uh -oh. and understand that human behavior is predicated on wanting to have good levels of dopamine and serotonin in your brain. When you think about it, there's two key behaviors for human survival, procreation and eating. And it's no coincidence that both of them are driven by dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway of the brain. We are hardwired as a species to chase dopamine. That is an undeniable fact. Mm 
Yeah. And what happens if then we're stuffed up your production of dopamine and you have lower levels of dopamine? And unfortunately, you just happen to be hardwired to chase dopamine. Is there anything that you can possibly think of that you could do to give a little spurt of dopamine and lift this gray cloud that you're now living in? So should we be giving everybody iron infusions? <laughs> Only if they're deficient. <laughs> but, but the answer is, what do you do to increase dopamine in your brain? You eat something sweet, something that these food scientists have crafted to have the bliss point to release a maximum amount of dopamine into your brain that you possibly can. Yeah. Does it work long? No. But now if you understand that this chronic inflammation, so when we see a lot of people and they, you've had these patients, they're, they're really type A personalities. They're really diligent. They're trying their best. Drink alcohol. They, they do these they engage in these behaviors and they don't even know why they do it. The reason they do it is self-medication for a dopamine deficiency because they're hardwired to chase dopamine and there's something in their physiology which is preventing their body from fully synthesizing dopamine. Now, it doesn't just have to be iron deficiency. If you're inflamed, that will lead to a functional iron deficiency. If you have an absolute iron deficiency because you're a vegetarian or you have malabsorption or you have heavy periods, whatever, yes, you'll feel that. But we also know that things like vitamin B12 and zinc, these are necessary to synthesize these neurotransmitters as well. So there can be a whole constellation of features. But I think in the last couple of years, I've, I've got a much better understanding of some of these underlying drivers of addictive eating behaviors. And the thing I find really rewarding is that when I explain it to my patients, they stop feeling guilty and right. they stop blaming themselves. And that allows us to start looking outwardly for a, actually look for a solution to the problem. Is it an autoimmune disease? Is it something in the diet that's triggering an inflammation in the gut and a malabsorption or what have you? There's multiple possible causes, but the number one factor that I like to focus on is let's absolve you of blame and let's start hunting for the cause. So let's talk about inflammation and metabolic disease. So going back to this topic. Um, because we see ferritin is, is very often uh, increased even when it's not autoimmune, or, unless you think that there's an autoimmune component as well. Well, this is absolutely fascinating. So when we actually look at, there's a condition that causes high ferritin and it's called hemochromatosis. Yeah. And if we actually have a look at the genetics of hemochromatosis, we can see that when societies all over the world went from iron-rich animal based diets to iron deficient grain based diets there became a, an evolutionary advantage to absorb more iron from the diet and that was uh, manifest in literally hundreds of genes so we normally say there's mainly two or three main ones mm -hmm. but there's literally hundreds okay. um, of genes that can do this and that showed that show the fact that it evolved in so many different ways around the world in so many separate places shows the absolute importance of iron in the diet now the trouble is when you when you pay paul you have to rob peter so if we're absorbing more iron from the diet with this condition hemochromatosis what are we absorbing less of what shares the same transporter that is that is being deprioritized and the answer is copper, copper. and we know that copper exerts a stabilizing influence on stored iron in the body and it reduces oxidative stress. And we've done, now we do a full circle coming back to oxidation. So when we see people with a, the, a lot of this uh, oxidative damage or high ferritin levels, and you know that this condition, hemochromatosis, leads to a, a number of endocrinological issues as well. It can affect the pituitary gland. It can affect the, the testes in males. It, it affects the liver. It, it really has wide reaching consequences. And that just speaks to the ability of excess oxidation stress to damage whatever it comes in contact with. It, it really doesn't discriminate at all. So if you're absorbing less copper because you're absorbing iron instead, we have very good evidence that copper is needed to stabilize iron. And with a relative copper deficiency that we see in this condition, the problem isn't that you have too much iron. The problem is that you don't have enough copper to stabilize that iron. And there was a very nice review article in the uh, British medical journal, Open Heart in 2018 by James Di Nicolo Antonio. And 
he's actually got some lovely references there where he actually demonstrates that uh, the LDL um, in the presence of a copper deficiency is far more likely to be oxidized because of the action of iron. And when you add copper back, then that oxidation of LDL reduces. And the, the title of the article actually basically infers that a copper deficiency is a hidden cause of, of a lot of heart disease around the world. And it's something that most doctors really have no awareness of. But whenever I see somebody with a high ferritin level, um, I always suspect that they probably, it, it's not that they have excess iron doing damage, it's that they don't have enough copper to stabilize that iron. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Not all elevated ferritin is caused by um, inflammation. Um, and we can usually test for that. Um, we can test for C-reactive protein and erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And some of the more progressive labs around the world will be doing something called hepcidin as well. Mm -hmm. But um, it should also be something that we do, that we do a HFE1 gene test. Mm -hmm. um, and even if we come back and you don't have this H63D or the C282Y mutation, which are the most common mutations, we should also bear in mind that there's literally hundreds of other mutations that could be causing problems that we don't detect. So, you know, this is, yeah, uh, as you know, you know, the more we dig into things, there can be layers of complexity that we add to the tapestry. But at the end of the day, it still comes back to the context, the concept of oxidative stress is bad. Very interesting. How, very interesting. Uh, how, how do you replace copper? Well, this is the interesting thing. So, I mean, the obvious thing is you eat it. Um, now, the problem is our food supply is relatively deficient in copper than it was 50 years ago. So mm -hmm. they did a study um, from the 1950s in Australia and then repeated it in the 1990s. And they were looking at the nutrient status of different micronutrients in the soil. And they actually found that of the micronutrients, copper, over that um, period of 40, 50 years, reduced by 75%. Oh. So yeah. farmers don't need to add this to the soil. So this affects animal foods raised on that land. It affects crops, plant-based foods grown on that land. It affects everybody equally. Basically, our food, not as nutritious as it used to be, and that absolutely includes copper. Farmers will add whatever they need to add to the soil to make crops grow. If they need to add nitrate, they will add nitrate. If they need to add magnesium and potassium, they will. But if they don't need to add copper, they won't add copper. They're, they're not adding things to the soil for our health. Right, they're but maybe they don't even know. Maybe it, it would help the plant grow, but we don't know. <laughs> well, possibly, but uh, I'm sure they've tried it. But that they add whatever they need to make the plants grow and to um, go to market. So, uh, oh, you know, what... So, you know, I know some people, they get copper drink bottles, you know, a lot of houses will, especially older houses will still have copper pipes. So no doubt you're picking a bit of copper up there. That's probably good for you. I, I think this is an area where we need to do a lot more research. It's certainly reasonable for some people to take a copper supplement under the, under the advice of your doctor. Um, but the problem is that you can't just go and source a particular food and say, I'm gonna eat anchovies or I'm gonna eat this or eat that. And that's gonna be high in copper because it really depends on where that food was raised and what the, the copper content of the soil um, leading to that food was. Mm -hmm. And chances are it's probably deficient compared to what it used to be. Right. Well, the good news is that in most cases, once you, you do start fixing your diet, regardless, if you just, without even knowing what exactly micronutrients you're taking, but you see the ferritin go down. So at least uh, oh, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's beautiful how, most of the time, it just starts to come down. So well, that's the problem. You, you don't want it too low and you don't want it too high. Yeah, yeah. But unless it's below 10, then you have to worry about having deficiency. Okay, so get, get this. So th this is a little bugbear of mine. Uh, let's talk about how females get the short end of the stick in medicine. Yes, which is a known fact. Yes. So as a female, and yeah. sure, take this as a loaded question. As a female, do you have, do you feel that you have less right to carry oxygen around your body than I do? <laughs> I don't think I've ever thought about this question. <laughs> of course not. I mean, but that's an utterly ridiculous proposition. Of course, 
you have every right to have good health and to be carrying oxygen around your body as well as I do. Why then yes. do we accept a lower hemoglobin level, a lower red blood cell level, and a lower iron level for a female than we do for a male? Is there something about female physiology that means they don't need oxygen as well? They don't need red blood cells as well? I don't know, but they say that menstruation might be, might be protective against heart disease, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I, why? Uh, here's here's why my we, take well, on it. Okay. So, on average, females do have lower red blood cells, mm -hmm. and they do have lower iron, and menstruation absolutely leads to that. And when we have a look at the recommended reference intervals on our blood tests, we have to understand that they don't reflect optimal health they reflect population averages right so it's and more the only reason that we accept these lower ranges for females is that on average they're already more likely to be deficient than a male but that doesn't mean that that's optimal for health mm -hmm. and it does my head in when we will accept a hemoglobin level of a female of 119 or 120 without saying it's abnormal when we wouldn't, you know, if a male was 129, we would call him anemic. I mean, this makes absolutely no sense to me. It's a, it's a great point. It's a great point. So, any, and, you know, you, you know what I think about these reference ranges. They, they really, they don't reflect optimal health at all. They just reflect population averages. And if we take 95% of the population, which is what most reference intervals uh, will assess and take, 95% of the population is not healthy. If you're being compared to that health. guy out in my waiting room who isn't a picture of health, you know, how is that fair to look at you and say, well, you're the same as him, therefore you must be healthy? He's not healthy. Right. My favorite is, is the insulin level, which the, the, it goes from like two to 29. Okay, as, yeah. as normal. <laughs> 29. So, you know, the patients see that their fasting is when it's 13 and they think they're fine, you know? That's bizarre. <laughs> so, I mean, my, my cutoff for a healthy insulin fasting is five. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, it's very, very misleading. Um, so Actually, one thing I want to talk about, because you and I both order a lot of insulin levels, and I hear a lot of people criticize a fasting insulin level and say that we should always be doing a craft test mm -hmm. the the two hour glucose tolerance with insulin now i love the craft test and i'm sure i've done more of them than anybody else in australia i've done hundreds of them but mm -hmm. i think that the fasting insulin gets a bad rap so when i actually repeat people and i've had patients over the last five years who i've repeated their insulin every six months mm -hmm. and if they're metabolically healthy there will be very, very, very little variation in their insulin, maybe one point or two points. It'll be four, it'll be five, it'll be four, five, four. You know, if they're maintaining a constant state of health, I will see that their fasting insulin will be very predictable and very reliable. So I've heard a lot of uh, commentators in the low carb field talk about how variable fasting insulin is and how we shouldn't ever trust it Mm -hmm. uh, as a test and that you must do the two-hour glucose tolerance test. And I have to say, based on the data that I've collated in my clinic, that's not my experience at all. And I find that a fasting insulin, if I see a fasting insulin of 14, as you just said, then I, I can say that. that's a problem. I trust that that's a problem. Right, 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 right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I was going the other way. Yes. No, and also I think um, even, you know, Practically speaking, it's so much easier to get a fasting insulin. And, and it's also very helpful because why should your insulin be high in the fasting state? So once you understand that as a patient, just you know, visually, you're like, oh, okay, so there is a problem here. So just, just to intellectually understand that is a, is a motivator, in my opinion. And the fact is that if you have a fasting insulin of less than five, then the chances that you'll have, and your sugar is well controlled, obviously we have to look at the sugar in concert, right. then the chances that you'll have a significant spike on a two hour glucose tolerance test is actually quite low. And if I have a look at my, my favorite metabolic parameters, if you've got a good HDL level, a good triglyceride level, 
a good glucose level and a good insulin level, I'm very happy to tick you off as being almost certainly metabolically healthy on a fasting test. And I don't think we necessarily need to put as many people through these glucose tolerance tests as we used to. Yeah, yeah. Well, practically, I don't have a really an option of doing it. So I, I really rely on the fasting. So, well, but that's interesting that you could see that you could see that correlation because it's, it's good to know. It's good to know. Yeah. The other, the other yeah. issue is the, is the liver function test, apropos what we're talking about, right? Uh, the, the normal range for the liver, liver is so large now, it's so wide because everybody has fatty liver. So now, oh God, yes. you know, so, you know, you're in the normal range, but clearly you have fatty liver, but nobody knows about it. So and, here's a trick, what you do. So if you're sitting there and thinking, is this blood result actually a good blood result or not? Just do a Google search type all cause mortality and type the blood test that you're looking. I guarantee you somewhere along the line, somebody will have done research associating longevity to that particular value. And you'll be able to get an indication of what lifespan, what the longest lifespan is associated with what number. And this is important. So people always say, oh, well, you don't want to live longer if you're living sicker. But in general, we know that a long lifespan also associates with a, a longer health span as well. So as far as markers go, objective markers of optimal health, I think longevity is probably the best one. And we assess that with all-cause mortality. And if you have a look at what we call ALT, which is probably the most common liver test we look at, then we know that once that's over 20, people's risk of dying starts to appreciably increase. And I've seen reference ranges that go all the way up to 55. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, the sugar and seed oils, <laughs> right, that have, that have normalized fatty liver. <laughs> now, I did, um, I've been doing a bit of thinking recently about vitamin D. Okay. And as an endocrinologist, I know that, you know, that's something that's close to your heart as well. Yes. And I, think, I get a lot of emails and people ask me saying, oh, you know, should I take vitamin D for coronavirus or this? It's a magical elixir. It's going to make me live longer. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion is that vitamin D is a surrogate marker of good health, but it's not a magical elixir of good health in isolation. If you have a high vitamin D level mm -hmm. naturally that you obtain from diet or what have you, then you are probably going to be in a much better state of health. But if you have a high vitamin D level because you've been swallowing a bunch of pills every day, that's going to have very, very little obvious health benefit. So there's a couple of things. So first, vitamin. Wait, so, say it again because it was cut off. Say that part again. First thing fat, was. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. Yeah. So... If you've got a lot of visceral fat, or a, a, you know, if you're obese, then the vitamin D in your body is going to go to the fat stores and it's going to dilute what is actually in the blood. And in the blood is what we actually measure and we associate with good health. Mm -hmm. So the heavier you are, the, more uh, the lower the vitamin D in your blood. And we've actually done research where we've exposed people to UV light and we've had a look at how much their blood levels increase by. And people who are heavier have much lower increases. When we supplement, we see the same. Right. If you have less fat to take it out of your circulation, then you'll end up with more of it in your circulation. So right off the bat, we see that vitamin D is something of a surrogate marker right. Absolutely. For, for good health. And we know that people in good metabolic health are more likely to survive viral infection, so on and so forth. So that's probably where most of this association between vitamin D and survival from coronavirus comes. It's just as a marker for being metabolically healthy. Right. Although now, vitamin D is also, okay, continue. No, you go. No, it's also very important for immune function. So. Oh, it's important for several things. But the interesting thing is that the level that we look at for bone health and these kind of things, a level of about 30 appears to be where the benefits of, say, bone health peak. Right. Whereas the level for all-cause mortality looks like it might improve all the way up to 100. 
Okay. But for all intents and purposes, my feeling is that if you're under 30 or possibly 50, you should supplement to make sure that your bone health is optimal. But if you're wanting to get to 100, we make sure you get there with a healthy diet and a healthy metabolism and not through supplements. Because if, if you get up to 100 through, through diet, I, I'm oh, not yeah. talking about that. Oh, yeah. Well, but, let's talk about why, because it's also a fat soluble vitamin. Mm -hmm. So it, it's found in saturated fats, animal foods. So, um, you know, grass fed beef and things like that. So I often see it up that high in my carnivore patients. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that, that 100 is really, really high. I mean, even 100 is high, in yeah. California that were just exposed to the sun all the time had levels of 80. So 100 is serious. Well, Let's talk about the sun. Let's talk okay. about why it increases in the sun. So I came across some research that shows that phytoplankton have been synthesizing vitamin D as a sunscreen for 500 million years. This is, it's, an, it's just the right size molecule to absorb ultraviolet B radiation. Phytoplankton? And ultraviolet B radiation uh -huh. causes DNA damage. So it's basically, it protect, it's right through from the earliest life forms, vitamin D has been used to protect DNA from ultraviolet B radiation. This is why it's synthesized in response to UVB radiation, because it protects you from UVB radiation. It's right. essentially a sunscreen. Does it make sense mm. that you could synthesize 50,000 units of vitamin D in response to the midday sun, and you would need to do that to be optimally healthy. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So this whole production of vitamin D seen to be necessary to be exposed to the sun only exists because we now no longer have these um, carnivorous style diets, which are very rich in vitamin D. Um, people on these kind of diets, they don't need to, to see the sun at all to get high levels of vitamin D. They're getting enough from their diet. In actual fact, <laughs> wow. we know that vitamin D is a protection, uh, protects you from the sun. We, we see that a lot of people, when they go keto, they actually, uh, they have much more resilience to sunburn. And the reason is this, what's vitamin D made from? It's made well, from cholesterol. So if you have higher cholesterol levels, you have a higher capacity to synthesize vitamin D. And that explains your resilience to sunburn. And I thought it was related D, also to the lack of seed oils. Apparently seed oils are also predispose you to sunburn. No? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Through the, the HNE kind of pathways, of inherent inflammation there. Um, now, Ansel Keys, bless his little heart, back in his seven country studies, in one element of the study, they studied um, some English folk um, and they looked at how much they would go into the garden and how much sun exposure they would have. And he actually found that those people having the most sun exposure had the lowest cholesterol levels. Why would that be? It's because when they're exposing themselves to the sun, their, their body is having to use that cholesterol, which we know is, you know, serves a lot of important functions in the body to exactly. make vitamin D, which is then protecting them from the sun. So I'm not trying to downplay the importance of vitamin D for bone health or anything at all like that. Um, but I am trying to downplay the importance of getting it from the sun. I believe that the sun is inherently healthful. And I've given a lecture on that where we talk about when you expose yourself to the sun, mm -hmm. the ultraviolet A radiation, your body actually generates something called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is an anti-inflammatory. It sensitizes the action of insulin. It's been shown to lower fasting blood glucose levels. It's been shown to lower average blood glucose level through HbA1c. It's been shown to be a vasodilator. It actually leads to lower blood pressure. Nitric oxide, um, one molecule of the year a while back. It is an amazing molecule. And all you need to do to make it is to go into the sun and expose yourself to UVA. Right. Not UVB, UVA. This is early morning, right? Like early morning and- uh, well, Late day, yeah. So basically- the way it works is that ultraviolet A is a very long wavelength. Ultraviolet B is a much shorter wavelength. And that means it gets attenuated or absorbed in the atmosphere um, much more readily than UVA. UVA will just keep on going through whatever. So it doesn't matter what the time of day is, UVA will basically be getting through to us. 
but the UVB radiation, if you imagine that you're, you're on the surface of the earth and you've got your atmosphere here, if the sun is going through the atmosphere on an angle, it will be passing through a much greater thickness of atmosphere and the UVB is attenuated passing through there. So when the sun is low in the sky, either early in the morning or late in the day, then there'll be very little UVB and the predominant UV that you'll be getting is the healthy UVA that gives you nitric oxide and has all these other benefits. In actual fact, there's some studies coming out of Scandinavia that demonstrate that on average, people with non-melanoma skin cancers, squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinomas, will have an extension of their lifespan of about 10 years compared to people without these two types of skin cancers. Crazy. Now, that's not to say the skin cancers are healthy. That's to say that there is definitely some health benefit, almost certainly deriving from exposure to the sun. Right. Now, Cialis and uh, Viagra should, you know... <laughs> are interesting uh, medications to think about. Oh, well, they're based on, yeah, so they're phosphodiesterase uh, 5 inhibitors from memory. And they, they work on the premise that they will lead to an increase in nitric oxide. And as we know, nitric oxide relaxes blood vessels and increases blood flow. So this is why they can actually contribute to an erection. Right. So, and maybe also uh, the heart is to preventing heart disease. <laughs> Well, they were originally, so uh, Viagra was, or Sildenafil, was originally used as a, uh, a drug for pulmonary hypertension um, when the, the pressure in the blood vessels of the, the, the blood vessels within the lungs actually got too high. And when they were actually treating a lot of these patients, they noticed that they had this uh, rather obvious side effect. Side effect. Whereas, uh, yeah, they, you know, they were able to do things that they hadn't been able to do. And enough of these patients mentioned to the study investigators and they said, well, hang on, we've got something better than uh, pulmonary hypertension to treat here. But you, you're absolutely right. This is premised based on the action of nitric oxide. Right, right. No, it's just interesting because uh, these patients normally fear taking the drug because it has a reputation for hurting the, the, the heart. But, oh, yeah. but, but it's, anyway, it's side, side comment. Well, it, it can actually cause problems because as you know, if you, uh, especially with Cialis, um, which has the nickname of a weekender because it lasts for 48 hours. Um, and if you, uh, we know that if people come into the hospital, we used to have this drilled into us, um, would work in emergency department. There's certain drugs that can lower blood pressure. You absolutely do not give a patient who's uh, just had Cialis or Viagra, um, one of these other blood right, pressure. Right, but it's just because they're because they're crash. Right. It's just because they're taking too many blood pressure things. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, so interesting. So, um, so bottom line is if vitamin D is low, do you uh, supplement vitamin D? Oh yeah, if it's low, because it, it still has value for as you know, it's involved in immune function, it's involved in bone health, and so on and so forth. So if it's too low, there is definitely benefit to raising it. But if you're really trying to aspire for that really high level of vitamin D, and you think that taking a bunch of supplements is going to make you somehow magically healthier because you have an extremely high vitamin D, I think you're kidding yourself. I think if you can achieve a very high level of vitamin D because you're metabolically healthy, because you don't have fat stores that are drawing it out of your circulation, because you're on a particularly nutrient dense diet that's rich in vitamin D. I mean, we've basically forgotten. We no longer teach junior doctors that you can get vitamin D from the diet. Right. right. Which is just crazy. And you absolutely can. Historically, We've never had any reason. So dark skin population never had any problem getting vitamin D because they were eating a healthy diet that was rich in saturated fats and vitamin D rich foods. So, mm -hmm. so if you want to chase a good level of vitamin D, by all means, chase it. Just don't chase it through a pill. Right. So I'm, I'm curious to hear about your carnivore patients. I'm, I'm also having a lot of fun in the clinic with this. How is, how... how Tell me about the difference between keto results versus carnivore and how, how how's it been for you? I mean, carnivore for some of my patients is keto on steroids. Um, it really is the ultimate elimination diet. And 
we often, because it's a really aggressive kind of terminology to talk about carnivore diets. So we often talk about it in euphemistic terms, an animal-based diet or an, an elimination diet or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. It, it just makes it sound terrible. <laughs> so, but certainly, look, a lot of patients go very, very well on it. So especially we talked earlier about people with autoimmune inflammation. And the simple fact is there's still a lot of substances in standard ketogenic diets that some people react to. So some people react to coffee, some people react to dairy, some people react to eggs, some people react to some of, you know, we, they often will have nightshade vegetables like capsicum and things like that. And some people react to, some people might have reactions to the oxalates in a spinach or kale. And, you know, a lot of people on keto diets are consuming large amounts of spinach. So the simple fact is that a ketogenic diet doesn't necessarily remove all the problematic food for some people. And I understand that I see, I've got quite a long wait list and I see a very biased selection. I see people who have sort of failed on a, a standard ketogenic diet. So I'm probably a little bit biased like that. Um, but the simple fact is a, a standard ketogenic diet does not work for everybody. Right. It will improve them. So, I mean, you give me any diabetic and they will improve going on a ketogenic diet, but will they get optimal results as good as they possibly could in other facets of their health that, you know, if they went on a more extreme elimination diet and cut a few more things out? Um, possibly not. Right. Right. I mean, the, the, for me, it's a very dramatic change when I, when I see when we stop the dairy, the dairy and the nuts, it's, it, that's a, the biggest jump for me. Um, well, the interesting result. thing is that dairy is quite unique at causing insulin resistance. And I have to explain that to, you know, probably two or three patients a day. Dairy is probably the biggest culture of people struggling to lose weight on a ketogenic diet. And it's logical when you think about it, because we give milk to young animals or young humans when we want them to grow rapidly, to get fat, to store fat. So there's certain growth factors in dairy that are designed to induce insulin resistance. A state of insulin resistance can be normal. Right. In uh, young children, it can be normal. In puberty, you want to grow rapidly. Insulin resistance is normal. And in pregnancy, a state of insulin resistance is normal. These are perfectly normal um, you know, physiological stages of life where I don't mind you being insulin resistant. The trouble is if you induce that insulin resistance because you're having a lot of dairy product and you're trying to lose weight, that makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree and I see it clinically all the time. I see, I see the difference between the classic ketogenic diet and, and when I remove the, the dairy. So what's the state of uh, low-carb diets where you are? I mean, obviously, are you still sort of a, a lone soldier promoting keto diets or are you getting more people coming on board where you are? Um, I would say there are very few clinicians uh, that treat with ketogenic diet. Very, very few. Certainly, I would say no endocrinologists that I know of um, are doing this. They, they might be going low carb, but I haven't seen endocrinologists. And I've barely seen family practice doctors. The one, the one I do have works with me. <laughs> there, you know, I have there are a few. There, there are few. That's not fair. But uh, and I, I, you know, we're still very few and far between. It's still a uh, kind of a. Um, do you, do you get much criticism or are you aware of any flack that you're getting from any other clinicians? I am sure I am. I, I hear rumors. <laughs> I hear rumors of what they say about me, but, you know, it's been, uh, you know, you just kind of do what you think is best for the patient. That's all. That's all that matters to me. But you, And your patients get better. Yeah. You know, the, you know, the, the, the issue is that uh, pretty much anybody that sticks with it that's fantastic. It's just that when the environment doesn't support you, it's really difficult. Uh, to, it's really difficult to hear from other doctors and from family members that you're harming yourself, that you're killing yourself. And, and um, so, so, you know, the compliance is key, but the compliance is so dependent on, on social support that this is something that we really try to work on. And, and that's uh, tough. I mean, when, when you've got I had a little bit of a hissy fit today because a patient came in and told me, you know, doctors make comments like, you know, you have to take this. If you don't take this, you're going to just drop dead. 
And you know, this happen? kind of hyperbole, like doctors have some kind of magical crystal ball where we can predict the future and see what's going to befall a patient. I mean, I I don't even know what I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to eat for breakfast tomorrow, let alone know what's going to happen to a patient if they take a medication, you know, you know, if, or don't take a medication. And I think doctors just have far too much consideration of their ability to predict these events. And they basically catastrophize to patients. I mean, I had a letter recently um, from a prominent uh, lipid specialist, um, very prominent. Mm -hmm. And the comment uh, was along the lines of, you know, he'd originally seen the patient and he's very, very scared about his cholesterol levels. They were, you know, really um, problematic. And then we did some further testing with a coronary artery calcium score. And his letter began is, um, fortunately, it seems like we've, averted an impending catastrophe. <laughs> what was the calcium score? Oh, zero. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but, the, but the LDL, you have to understand, the LDL was high. Right, right. Yeah. But this is the issue. Anyway, it, don't get me started. It's so... It's, so, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's such it, emotive it, language that is used to manipulate patients and to scare patients. And the patients actually believe that the doctor actually has some kind of insight into what is actually really going to happen. And it's, it's just coming from a land of make-believe. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're originally uh, more, you, you trained in, phys, in exercise, right? Like you were an exercise. Well, I, I'm a physiotherapist. Physiotherapist. By background. But now are you working with this as well? Or your clinic is mostly medical? No, no, no. No, I mean, that's, uh, I, I can't maintain registration as a physio. So, I, see. I mean, I still treat a lot of athletes. I see, I see. I mean, I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician. Um, and I mean, what is fun is, is when I have, um, I, I've got a lot of elite athletes who, you know, their performance goes way up. I mean, there was just, this I had a chat yesterday and there was a newspaper article about a, a chap who was, uh, had gone carnivore and, he's actually performing out of his skin this year. Um, he's a very senior player on a top team and they're doing very well. And, you know, it's really quite satisfying when you see, you know, these athletes at the top of their game. And in this newspaper article, he actually said, for me, it's been a game changer. And I, I don't know if he realizes the irony of that after the movie. That statement. Game but, you know, and I, I'm quite sure he didn't mean anything by it, but it's just the delicious sense of irony. Sure. But I mean, the simple fact is I see a lot of athletes who trial vegetarian and vegan diets and they just fail, their performance suffers. And when right. I educate them and they change. Um, so when they, they, when they train, they, you, you train them on carnivore, but then on the, on the performance day, do you give them some kind of starch or some kind of? So not always, not necessarily. So sometimes for comfort, um, but it, it's a psychological crutch, but we have to be careful that we don't want them to have too many carbs that will increase their insulin level to a point of where it will impair their ability to oxidize fat. Ah. So it's a real balancing line. If we do give them a bit of a psychological crutch in terms of a carbohydrate, it's got to be a very token amount so that we don't interfere with the, the metabolic process that we've trained them up for. Right, right. Do you have, have you ever used UCAN? I mean, I never. Yeah, have. yeah. So, I mean, you can is a, a heat treated uh, cornstarch matrix. It's basically got a very low glycemic index. Um, so, that's pretty much one of the optimal things. But to be honest, most people don't need it. You can get away with having sweet potato or something like that, you know, the night before a match or something, as long as it's not too much. Sometimes we don't even use it for a performance advantage so much. Well, the, the athlete might think that they're doing that but they're usually usually using it as a psychological crutch to give themselves a bit of comfort a bit of confidence right um, and what about and exercise for the regular person what's your what, what's your recommendation well nothing there's two factors um well it depends on the average female the average male i mean i've been seeing more and more um postmenopausal females with bone health issues recently and as you know, there's now very good data. You can reverse osteoporosis with diet, but I still think exercise has a role to play. So there's two bones that are particularly important for a female with osteoporosis. So it's called the neck of the femur, what we call the hip bone, 
and the distal radius, which is just the end of the wrist bone here. And uh, we, the reason they're important bones is because if you fracture a hip, you're stuffed. And it's very, very common to do what we call a collar's fracture and fall on an outstretched hand and fracture your distal radius. So exercises to strengthen those bones actually needs to put force through those bones. So I always make sure that those patients are having a step exercise. So they're doing a lot of stairs or step ups or something like that, or potentially even hopping to make sure we load the neck of the femur. Mm -hmm. And then I also give them push up style exercises. And that really depends on how strong they are. And I'll, you know, either a proper push up or a push up on the knees or a push up against the bench or a push up against the wall. Right. Uh, but I really want at the very minimum, I would expect most females will be doing knee push ups. And irrespective of your age, I will always be trying to get them to do full length push ups. And I think that if you, you know, that's putting force through the distal radius and combined with a healthy diet, that's going to lead to optimal strengthening of the bone. So that's exercise for bone health. We know that you don't need a hell of a lot of repetitions. Um, to stimulate bone health. So you, you don't have to go and do, you know, run up, you know, run a half marathon every day. Simply doing 10 hops two or three times a week is probably going to lead to an almost optimal stimulus to, you know, increase the strength of your hip, for instance. Wow, I didn't know that. I thought it was more. 10 hops yeah, two times a week? That's great. Yeah, so you need, you, you need a certain amplitude of impulse. It, you need resistance. But it... it the benefit actually tops out pretty quickly. So you don't need to do a huge amount. Um, you need to do it high enough impulse and you need to do it regularly. Now, in terms of, you know, I recommend that everybody do resistance training. I think that's, you know, that's beneficial for so many reasons. You increase your muscle mass, you increase something we call the GLUT4 transporter. That leads to better sugar control in people who are diabetic. There's so many benefits. Um, if you're strengthening your muscles, you're strengthening your bone. So a couple of key exercises, I think everybody, you know, they should be doing a jumping type exercise or a squatting type exercise. They should be doing a pushing type exercise like push-ups and they should be doing a pull-up exercise or a you know, curling type exercise. Mm -hmm. And if you can get those three exercises into your routine, you don't need to exercise for hours every day. You can, you can do high resistance, you know, you can get that done in five minutes, literally. And if you do that three days a week, that's enough. That's enough for strength. Most people don't realize that the intensity of the exercise is what confers a lot of the benefit. So right. if you actually exercise to complete fatigue with good resistance, so fatigue means when a patient says, how many push-ups should I do? My answer is almost as always as many as you can. Plus one. If, you, if you've got any left in the tank, you didn't do enough. You have to go, you have to work yourself hard. But we know that if you do work yourself to complete failure with good resistance, then doing one set is at least as 90% as effective as would be doing three sets. So it really leads to an efficiency of exercise. And then obviously we like to do a bit of cardiac and the best bang for your buck with cardiac exercise is high intensity interval training. Right. So there was a study, this is you know, probably getting on for 20 years ago, where they compared patients who were riding for one hour a day on an exercise bike at moderate intensity versus a group that was riding for a total of six minutes a week. So six hours a week, moderate intensity versus six minutes a week at very high intensity. And that six minutes a week was done over three days, um, 30 seconds on um, times four on uh, you know, three days in the week. Yeah. And the fitness gains at the end of a six week period between the two groups was absolutely equivalent. So right. we know that high intensity stuff, so six minutes of intense training is equivalent in terms of fitness gain to six hours. So high intensity interval training is really where it's at. Totally, totally. Well, listen, we've been prattling on for a long time. Super fun. I totally enjoy speaking with you. And let's do this again in the future. And well, I actually want to come and visit. Well, I can't wait. We're going to have our, hopefully our conference in person. So. Um, no way. Is that even ever going to happen again? Of course it's going to happen. I'm an optimist. <laughs> it feels like, for, actually, I, we, we had an in-person conference in Melbourne earlier this year. Yeah. Um, oh. So that, that, was, um, that was real. That, that was, was getting real. real. That was real. No, we're definitely going to do it. And uh, we haven't decided yet when, but we'll. 
Well, so job, my government is basically, you know, I'm not allowed to travel at the moment. So even if you had a conference on, I'm not allowed. I see, we we'll still have to wait. I, I'm in the naughty corner for the moment. <laughs> All right, but we'll get there. Anyway, super, Paul. Have a it's, great night. It's been a blast. <laughs> see you next time. Bye bye. Okay, okay. Wait one second.